Actually, it's not a change of topic. We're going to talk about love. 30 years ago, 37 years ago, I met my wife here at SMU, and she pulled me out of this country to her country, Malaysia. For 20 years, I lived in Malaysia, and then Singapore, and then Austria. I've been back here a little more than 10 years, and all that time, I've been asking myself one question. What is it that makes people succeed in some kind of cross-cultural engagement, relationship, business negotiation, whatever? What makes it work? Because there are some brilliant successes. There are people who, against all odds, enter into cross-cultural relationships that come out brilliantly well. They overcome many challenges. But there are also people who fail spectacularly, and they do it no matter how hard they try and how much they know. So I've been looking at people who succeed and fail now for 30 years, and I think to learn the lessons that they have to teach us, we have to talk about a couple of them. Well, we'll talk about six of them. The first two were two guys that worked in Singapore about 100 years ago. They were both the managers of the Methodist Publishing House, which in the year 1900 was the largest publishing company in Asia. The first one was William Shelabir. He was an Englishman who arrived in Singapore in 1886. He lived in Singapore and Malaysia for 30 years. And when he left, government officials, business leaders, church leaders, his own workers gave him a hero's farewell. He was fated across Malaysia and Singapore and sent home, and he continued to write things for the Methodist Publishing House until the day of his death. The other man was W.T. Cherry. W.T. Cherry looked like an excellent replacement for Shelabir. He was a well-known Seattle businessman, a very pious man, a man of the church, but his career in Singapore was quite short. After only a few years, he left supposedly because of ill health. In reality, when you go back and look at the newspapers, he was kicked out of Singapore by the colonial authorities. The reason he was kicked out, well, the official charge was defenestration, which means he threw his workers out the window when he got mad at them. Four of them. Even in colonial Singapore, that was not acceptable. When he left, no one minded, no one came to the party, and very few people remembered him. Now, what was the difference between Shelabir and Cherry? Well, if you look at Shelabir's life, one of the things you see is that he loved Singapore. He loved the Malays, he loved the Chinese, he loved the Indians, he loved the languages, and he learned all of them. He loved Singapore because it brought something out of him. He came as a soldier, he ended as a scholar. He liked the food and the people and the climate, and he left with regret because he'd had malaria just one too many times. W.T. Cherry, he didn't like the climate. He found the food unpalatable. He found the people unpredictable. And all of that left him with a low-level boiling anger that whenever it popped up, led him to throw someone out a window. Again, not acceptable behavior. The difference between the two men was love. One loved the culture he was in, the other one, at best, indifferent. He may have hated it. Now, those two men could have been diplomats, to be very honest with you, and I've known quite a few diplomats over the 20 years I was overseas, and I had a chance to study a couple of them, so I'm gonna mention two, although I'm not gonna use their real names because they're both still active. One of them we will call Ambassador Carroll. Carol arrived in the country where I was living and immediately threw herself into the cuisine, the sports, the arts, all of that stuff. She learned the language. She actually put her children in local schools. And she did fabulously well. People were crazy about her. She did a lot of business deals, and that's what ambassadors are really supposed to do, is help the U.S. business interests. And she scored one major diplomatic coup in a very, very difficult situation. The other ambassador we're going to call Ambassador Fred. Ambassador Fred, I met first as he was falling asleep next to me at a cultural show. Uh, he couldn't have made it clearer that he didn't want to be there. He tended to hang out with his fellow Americans when he could. He ate his lunches at the local five-star hotel where they had a Western buffet. 
He had said that he had come to do business. And as he said, selling is selling, whether you're in Kentucky or Kathmandu, except that he didn't sell anything. The reason he didn't sell anything was because local business there was done after you built trust around a big business lunch at some local restaurant, and he couldn't be pulled out of the five-star hotel to go eat at local restaurants. And without that kind of trust, because trust is built on cultural rituals, without that kind of trust, no one wanted to do business with him. When he left two years later, he hadn't sold anything, nothing American, certainly not the American fighter planes he wanted to sell. And I think he was as happy to go, frankly, as people were to see him go. Why the failure? A failure of love. Now, this love I'm talking about is not infatuation. This is not the kind of thing, the sort of thrill you get when you watch a PBS documentary or one of those things about tropical beaches, you know, you fall in love because, oh boy, the people look good. And it's also not the sort of infatuation you have because you see a European museum full of special art. It's not that kind of thing. Infatuation will not give you the emotional sustenance to last in another culture. Infatuation is not going to get you through the difficult process of learning a language. Infatuation is not going to get you through eating the same boring meal day after day after day that you never liked to begin with. I, I can't even begin to start about learning to like preserved eggs in porridge. The, these are eggs that are colored various shades of black, gray, and blue. They're just egg shaped, but they're really just infusions of chemicals. Infatuation is not going to help you like preserved eggs. It's got to be love. And the reason it's got to be love is because our culture rests in our heart. Our culture rests in our heart, and our behavior is determined much by what comes out of our heart. And so you've got to cultivate love. You've got to be able to take what belongs in your head and bring it down into your heart. The things that delight your eye have to be emotionally desirable as well. Because it's the heart that's going to tell you what's appetizing and what's revolting. It's the heart that is going to tell you who's trustworthy and who you should be suspicious of. It is the heart that's going to tell you what's pleasurable and what's ugly. And so if you're going to work in another culture, that culture is going to have to come into your heart where there it can begin to, to guide your behavior. Let me tell you another story. This is a hypothetical story. Imagine yourself. Imagine yourself. Oh, wait, I forgot. Romance. How do you get something into your heart? It's romance, isn't it? That was the other thing I discovered about all these people. All these people that were successful were romantics. They understood that you don't love culture, you make love to culture. You don't look at culture and go, oh, what a good looking culture. <laughs> no, you invite it for a date. You take it to dinner, you look deeply into its eyes, you let it look deeply into your eyes, you carry on some conversation, you learn about it. And you let that culture choose the restaurant and the movie and the cultural show. By the way, the culture gets to decide whether there's going to be a kiss or a handshake at the door as well. <laughs> I'll tell you some stories after this talk. So let's do a hypothetical. You get in an airplane, you fly to Shanghai. This is your first step to a big business deal. You land in Pudong Airport. That's just a big international airport. Nothing new there. There's a driver waiting for a car. Nothing new there. You go to the five-star hotel. Nothing new there. Slightly different looking people running the place, but five-star hotels around the world are five-star hotels. And so you stand at your big picture window and you're looking out on the Bund, the famous Bund, and the Huangpo River, and the huge towering buildings of New Shanghai, and you're going, I have got this made. I'm gonna rock this. And then the big boss from the company you're doing business with picks you up in his Mercedes to take you to his favorite restaurant. And what's his favorite restaurant? Wait a minute, this is next to a mechanic shop and it's like an open air place hanging over an open air sewer. And then the big boss, before anybody sits down, starts shouting at the waitresses. What kind of guy shouts at the waitresses? And the waitresses come around and what are they serving? Warm Coca-Cola, you want a gag. Then the, what's, what's the Chinese word for ice you can't remember? Bing, bing shui. 
but you don't know how to ask. You just know the word fries. And then the food starts coming out. There's a plate full of tentacles. And then there's a whole chicken with a head. And then there's something that the big boss calls a sea cucumber that looks like a worm stuffed with its own excrement. <laughs> How can I do business here? The guy shouts at the waitress as he serves whole chickens and worms. The evening's not going to go well, is it? No. Because your emotional reaction is coming from your home, but you're in Shanghai. The mind and the heart are not aligned together, and that's the biggest cause of cultural failure. The mind and the heart are not aligned together. So let's rewind just a minute. Remember that old song? If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. <laughs> love the one you're with. So we go back. I'm now looking out over the window. Awesome. I'm going on my first date with Chinese culture. Got to get ready for it because first dates are always impressed if you know a little bit about them. Not too much, that's creepy. <laughs> okay, you get the cuisine. I learn a little bit about the Chinese cuisine. I learn a little bit about Chinese dinner etiquette because you always want to be well-mannered on your first date. Once I get that stuff, I start preparing myself emotionally. I go, okay. I'm going to go see this food. There's 500,000 kinds of good food in the world, and I've never had any of them. And all 500,000 and five more are served here in Shanghai. So this is going to be an adventure. I am Marco Polo. I am Isabella Bird, discovering the treasures of the East. I'm Indiana Jones. I'm the Duchess of Windsor looking for love in all the wrong places. I am, I am going to charm this culture to death, and I'm going to be charmed by it. And it goes well. Now, oh, one thing, don't even think about the numbers and the business plan and the business deal. You don't make your first business deal at the first dinner. That's like sex on the first date. People are just think you're an opportunist. No, you've gone there for love. And what's going to happen? Well, are you going to make the business deal? No. You know that doesn't work that way. What you get is a second date. A chance to visit the manager, a chance to go to the factory, a chance to carry on the conversation. Because what's established between you and your partners is a kind of a warmth, a fellow feeling that makes you want to do business with each other. Nothing draws out appreciation more than being appreciated. And that warmth, that warmth, whether it's in business or diplomacy or international development, that warmth is the pilot light that lights the flame of commerce and of negotiations and of successful development. You want to go global? Fall in love. Then you'll set the world on fire. Thank you.